This podcast you're about to listen to is an interview that I did with Charlie Tishner, the Facebook disruptor. And he has a crazy story from heroin addict and pizza boy to managing over a million dollars a day for Nissan. And now he teaches how to do tons of this stuff. Charlie's gonna break down what he calls his one campaign blueprint, how they're leveraging broad for massive scale, how they're being incredibly simplified and very uh, focused with their advertising in a way that doesn't take a billion hours to manage. Uh, And then he shares his very strong feedback on some metrics like return on ad spend, ROAS, what so many of us in the advertising world know and love and so many people flaunt it around. So please enjoy this episode with Charlie Tishner. Everybody today, I have, I have Charlie T. Tishner, and he is known as the Facebook disruptor. Um, and whenever I bring someone on that is like super nerdy and super talented, nerdy in a good way, and very talented, um, I get really excited because, especially when it's someone that I've actually followed for. I, pro- I probably you probably don't know this. I followed you for like six months now. Um, okay, I was first introduced right. to you by the founder of Zero Shoes, who I had on my podcast. Um, I was at a marketing meeting at the round table with their whole marketing team. And he's like, have you heard of this guy named the Facebook disruptor? And I'm like, <laughs> never heard of him. And this back in October of last year. And he uh, he tells me, you need to check this out. So we check it out. I get on your newsletter. I follow you on Instagram. And I've been watching all your stuff. And I'm like, I put you on my, my wish list of people to get on here, man. So I'm excited you're here. But for everybody listening, I just want to, I'm just going to lay out the rap sheet real fast. So you you kind of lean in and listen here. Um, Let's do Charlie it. has done, has over a decade of experience in Facebook ads. Oh, that's a lot of experience. Um, Over a billion dollars in revenue driven. He has a client list of different eight, nine figure direct to consumer and some SaaS brands. Uh, He has worked with brands like CBS Television, Domino's, (laughs) Nissan, Jamba Juice, and New Balance. I bet your dad is so proud. New Balance, man. You even- Yeah, I I was part of the, I don't know if you remember about five, six years ago, New Balance tried to get younger. Okay. Like it used to be like the mall walker brand. And then they tried to go to like late twenties, but I was behind that. We got into like 35, 38, but yeah, that was, you know, at the same time I was doing Disney stuff and I worked with Activision and, you know, Levi's and Apple and, you know, I used to be, you know, I was, I was supervisor of the LA office at Omnicom performance media called resolution media. So seven figure daily budgets for, just a ton of evil international conglomerate companies. So it's been a lot of fun. (laughs) That's amazing. So now you are, you call yourself the Facebook disruptor. Why do you call yourself that? Um, Honestly, it came from, it was originally CT, the disruptor was a Twitter account because when I first got onto Twitter, because I was doing some stuff with DTC newsletter and pilot house Mm -hmm. and I got a Twitter account and I hadn't had one. And I was just excited because I had, over the years before that, been banned from every Facebook group where people talk about ads because I was bad for business for every guru and their like nonsense funnels. And so when I finally made it back, I was like, oh, I'm going to be able to talk to all the other people from the disruptor group because I was in the founding core five, six brands in the Facebook disruptor group. Uh, okay. Content Nutrition, Purple Mattresses, Smile Direct Club, Movement Watches, and Match Group. Nice. I'm wearing um, a movement watch right now. I love that. Nice. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Um, and I was head up at 310 Nutrition at the time. Um, but yeah, work with, with, so I was part of the original core. And mm-hmm. so I was just like, oh, cool. I'm going to meet up. I'm going to finally get the chance to talk to all these people again. And I realized that like none of them were public about it. Mm. But I had already, it took me like three, four months to realize that. And I had already basically been branded at that point. And uh, I realized, you know, I realized that. The world had moved on from the what I had seen in 2015, 2016 of all these people teaching really bad information. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the things that I had brought were apparently really uh, disruptive to bad thinking. And so I just kind of leaned into it. And to be fair, like it, it fit. Uh, mm. And I, I, I try to say that as it's not there to be, I'm not trying to be, uh, I, I don't want to be, what I guess you know, comp, uh, argumentative or mm, try to be okay. contrarian. I instead want to focus on 
helping people fo- helping people think in a, in, a, in a more productive manner than the myopic view that most media buyers have been taught to because they were trained by somebody that doesn't know how Facebook works or don't care about mm-hmm. business's bottom line as a standard operating procedure. And yeah. I think let's actually care about things that matter instead of the ego of the marketer. And that's going to mm-hmm. make marketers a lot stronger and help prevent a lot of the damage that's been done by most marketers to most brands. Wow. You, it's pretty crazy. Um, I agree with all, I love that. I think that's great. I think there's just so much, the problem in the marketing world, because we're both in it, and you've been in longer than I, is the ego is like the largest thing. I can't stand it. So when I see like, you'll never see me in front of a car in an ad. You'll never see oh. like, my my ads are goofy, us like having fun and doing stuff like, and, and, and your stuff that I've seen is very similar. So I love that you've really stayed true to that. Um, so something that I watched not too long ago, and I think it was like a week and a half or two weeks ago. So you released a video and you called it from delivering pizzas to running ads for Nissan. Yeah. And I know in that at some point, I'd love to like for you to just take us back a little bit here. Um, because I know at some point you were a you were a heroin addict, a mm-hmm. pizza boy, and now you've gone on to not only work with big brands, but now teach people how to do the same thing. Like, how did those worlds even connect? Like, can you just take get bring us through that story to where you are now? Yeah. Um, um I mean, basically. So after high school, I became a pretty big drug addict, moved, went to college, got a gig as a touring musician. You know, I did that thing. I was a radio personality on Sirius XM and I was rewarded for that kind of partying. But I got really good at self-promotion to the point where other people paid me to help promote them. And, you know, Mm. you learn a skill when you're a touring musician and a radio personality. And, um, you know, I went from answering phones at a AM radio station at my own college radio to being an afternoon drive time host on Bubba the Love Sponge. And then the whole Coke and sex tape happened. That ruined my radio career. A bunch of people caught charges. And I basically fled Florida um, to move to cool. L.A. And Wait, kind of hold, on, hold on a second. Yeah. Let, let's just rewind real quick. What <laughs> what happened there? Whole Coke and so, sex tape. And so how Hulk did you Hogan get tied into that? sex tape. <laughs> Bubba the Love Sponge. Filmed Hulk Hogan having sex with Bubba's wife, and they were in on it. It was like a Florida thing, whatever, and no judgment. Um, But then leaked it to Gawker, and there was a huge scandal. And as a result, Hulk Hogan and Howard Stern were the underwriters of Bubba Love Sponge's radio network on Sirius XM. It was an extension of the Howard Stern radio network. Uh, and as a result of that happening, they were just like, well, we're going to pull our funding. And I went from being an afternoon drive host with a couple million listeners around the world to – um chains on the door and it was a now a howard stern replay channel wow um and many other things had happened but i basically had the choice of like jails institutions or death and i moved like 2500 miles and got sober wow that's and crazy okay i started to do organic social media stuff for for other things and i got a job my first gig uh, was uh doing data entry at some like illegitimate social media agency on Hollywood Boulevard for like 10 bucks an hour. And I ended up automating all my work. I ended up basically doing the work of like eight people in a couple of hours. I watched all of the wire at my desk in about two and a half months before I got fired. And I brought the biggest client with me and Mm. I started a social agency just doing organic growth hacking, ended up going on AMC show, the pitch. And I was part of their last episode. Once they put me on TV, they canceled the show. Uh, we won the episode. They just saved the best for the last. That was it. They saved the best for last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were like, "This, no, you're done. You're done. Cut. <laughs> yeah, funding pulled. Who, who made like? I'm not even on screen for that much for that long. But um, so we won that, and mm. then because of getting that business, my business partner at the time was also my attorney, mm. and he had designed the paperwork. So basically, the sign, the, the ink wasn't dry on that contract, and I was fired. And uh, I took the biggest clients with me again. And my biggest client at the time fired me because one day he put in a hundred bucks into Facebook to run ads. And he's like, dude, uh, I, I spent a hundred bucks on ads. It, pays, it did more for me than paying you 2000 a month does. And mm. he honored the contract, paid it out, but it was like, we're done. And uh, the next day I put my credit card into Facebook and started promoting my band. And within three months, I was running stuff for like Jamba Juice and Viking River Cruises Within mm. six months, I was doing things for like Jane Silent Bob and Robert Rodriguez movies and, you know, Carrie Gaynor smoke, non-anti-smoking stuff. 
And mm. within nine months, I was supervisor at the Omnicom office because literally having run ads for nine months meant that I was one of the top five most experienced, top 5% most experienced people. And like I had performance marketing chops at agencies doing multiple things. And I have an MBA and, uh, you know, I have a couple of college degrees because fun fact, uh, if you go to college, I didn't realize the ramifications of student loans, but like I just kept getting paid. I just kept getting giant checks written to me for showing up to school. So I ended up collecting a whole bunch of pay, uh, like uh, a whole bunch of checks uh, instead of having real jobs. But I just created a mountain of like student loan debt, which I've since paid off. But like uh, that's how I kind of sustained myself, that and wow. being a musician. Um but so I ended up showing up with like three college degrees, an MBA in business from the Harvard Business Review and having more experience than everybody else and running ads on Facebook. And they were like, hey, we need somebody to manage like seven figures a day for these big brands. And we need to do very specific things. And I had the ability to talk, walk the walk and talk the talk and do scientific case studies. So I got put in role or basically uh, seven figures a day. No mm -hmm. real overhead. And my bosses had no idea how to do what I was doing. And so it was the Wild West for a little bit. And that was a lot of fun. And I was a bad employee. Like, I didn't know how to use Outlook. I was showing up in, like, band T-shirts and cowboy boots and ripped jeans. And, like, I was like, <laughs> I had a gig last night. and just show up in whatever I was wearing. Like That's amazing. Uh, you know, I was more eccentric than the creative directors at, at Shia Day and all of those good guys. And... Uh, you know, I, I bounced around from agency to agency, basically. I'd work there for six to nine months. I'd get fired. I'd get my boss's job at the spot next door. And eventually mm. I went client side, vendor side, and really just had a huge, just very round experience to get me to that place. And now I've been in a spot where, you know, over the last five years, I think I'm personally a partner in my fourth business that's going to go from... Like they brought me in doing 50K a month a year and a half ago, and now we do a million a week. Wow. That's the fourth time in the last five years I've done that, and I'm about to join my fifth one uh, that's on a similar rate, and, and I've also grown my own stuff. And it's now uh, – it's not lucky. It's a process. And yeah. so I've really just tried to take what I've learned and make it readily accessible to people. And generally that is – Difficult for people to take in, but I look at it as a, from a business perspective. And that means that uh, what I have to say comes from a different place. And that's just come from my background of having to make a million dollars a day work is a lot yeah. different than somebody trying to keep a client that's spending 30,000 a month by looking better on a report so that somebody else gets fired, even though I'm not doing any decent work. And wow. that just gives me a different perspective. 